seats. But I'm very pleased I did because the Goths got a mighty gap from scene two. But I reflected on the column, some of you will remember, ever been at. Ever been at a maze, trying to increase the rose one night from a deep dream of peace. Cut a long story short, in a list of people who love the Lord, Abby's name didn't appear. And then that ever said, don't worry about that. Write me as one who loves his fellow man. And I thought, and his name went up at the top of it. And it's great to be at the top. So in 1937, I became the first child of Ivy and Larry Fogden uh, at Innisfar. Now I made the right decision because Dad had been out of the rail industry for 60 years, had been socked, sacked by the Queensland Rail uh, over the 27 sugar dispute. Um, and he worked on the trains and he used to bring blokes who were jumping the rack as they had to move about to be able to draw on sustenance on the on the double. And Dad would bring them home for a meal that he found them on the train that he would work in. So my mum and my dad were members of the at the time of the So I thought that was pretty, fairly good choice to come out. Now, I remember my dad had ultimately transferred to Mackay, and I can remember he may well have been the chairman of the meeting at which Gloria Field spoke, because I can remember his coming home from that meeting wearing a black suit, he had the only one suit, so he probably was married, you know, and it was covered with tomato <laughs> And I can remember at a subsequent meeting, the move was on to Tim Over, Alan Ollett, you remember, some of you might remember Alan Ollett, who was an activist on the wharf in Mackay, Alan Ollett's utility. And Ian Wood, a Tory, and at that time was the Mayor of Mackay, held within, held the inspector of police within my ear, and the hearing of a few other comrades uh, there. Uh, told the inspector of police to go back to you and stop them from uh, approaching the, the truck. Well, there were a few of those incidents. But I was full steam ahead to become a teacher. Thank goodness I did. Not only for myself, but all those, those kids. <laughs> <laughs> the Gear government refused me permission to become, uh, to go to the teacher's training college. And ultimately, in consequence, I joined the Rebels. Now, I didn't join the Communist Party while I was living at home. I joined it when I was in Mount Island, about 1965. A lot has been written about this period, and I'm quite fascinated by some of the observations by a by the name of Hayden Kiernan. Uh, he hasn't yet published, but he's doing a, a doco. And he said, an ACO file is the best a memoir. Now I would pay my parents Asia files as well as my own. And it's just marvelous to feel the warmth of going back in history, names of the block, good people, great people. And he also said to me in an email, on the 4th of July of this year, he said, and it's frightening to know what they were, that they were used to keep, uh, talking about Asia, uh, people out of employment, to 
Koreans were destroyed and lives damaged. No question. Look, time is a problem. I just want to offer a, a brief list in the interests uh, of controversy, and in the interests of uh, stimulating the life. I've always been concerned about the communist dogma and rosary without the beads. All the slogan, slogan. There was a cargo camp culture mentality. And of course, significantly, uh, Bolivar, uh, who was speaking of Tusk, the political dumbing down of the ARP and the politicisation of the church. And while all of this was happening, The socialist models, in many cases, for a lot, became solid. Hand in hand with that, the capital serving te technological innovation was facilitating the entrenchment and the expansion of international. I want to pay tribute in finality to the very fine comrades who will forever remain a legend in this country, who led the various unions. Doesn't, oh, sorry, doesn't mean, mean, mean to detail the names. Remember the leadership of the Waterside Workers and Miners Union? Union, many of them. And I think that means we see. And in finality, I believe that except for the Communist Party and the progressives, we have been now living in a post global war period. Friends, the question is. Were the efforts of progressive people to struggle for dignity, fairness of the human body and mind, the human body, mind and spirit of all peoples in a peaceful world, a peaceful way, for a peaceful world, world worthwhile? Is that your answer? Thank you. Australia in 1923, 
and had no interest in politics. She told me the women had to wait until the men came home from the hotel on election day to be told how to vote. This didn't suit my mother, who started to take an interest in politics, gave up her religion and joined the Communist Party in the 1940s. In 1944, when I was 14, my parents left Collinsville and came to Brisbane to live. My mother became very active in the Communist movement and subsequently the Union of Australian Women, which was a broad-based organisation of working-class women whose aims were to advance the status of women, improve living conditions and for the well-being of children in a world free of war. The Union of Australian Women believed in working closely with other women's organisations with similar aims and importantly with the trade unions. When I was young, I remember my mother going to meetings and many members of the party visiting us. Vividly, I remember Jean O'Connor. She was Jean Alden in those days, with her lovely blonde hair piled high on her head. And I think she did wear that style until she passed away. In 1946, when I was 16, I started marching on May Day. I remember a May Day march when we were all asked to go to the trade hall before the march and were given small peace flags which we put hit out the sleeves of our jumpers. And it was cold in, on May Day in those days. And at a given stage of the march, we all waved the small flags. We also marched for the peace movement on other occasions. It was not always easy to be identified with the peace movement. In 1960, the federal government proposed far-reaching amendments to the Crimes Act, which, led to, which could lead to the jailing of peace organisations, including the Union of Australian Women. And as noted by the Reverend Frank Harley of the Victorian Peace Movement, when he said, it is a notable feature of the Cold War that as nations become more and more involved in Cold War politics, policies, the civil liberties of its people have been progressively curtailed and its peak movement has been persecuted. It is ludicrous but blatantly dishonest and deadly serious that this denial of freedom should be carried out under a slogan of protecting the free world. In 1948, at the age of 18, I joined the Communist Party, having been invited, in, been invited to do so by Jim Henderson, who also came from Collinsville. I was a member of the Eureka Youth League and met many children of communists there. They were really good times for us, going to camps, dances and meetings, and we were quite aware that we were being watched. I met um, Hugh's wife there, Judy. I was more active in the Communist Party after I was married in 1952. I worked in three of the party offices and was quite aware of the fact that there was always an unmarked car with two or three men watching everyone who went into the party office. We knew we had to be careful about what we did. While our meetings were monitored often with the presence of special branch cars sitting outside. Special branch cars were often parked intimidatingly outside of the houses of Communist Party members. Some members of the party thought that copies of Marx's Capital had to be kept hidden in case they were searched and it would be revealed that they were communists. Phones were tapped. The use of communist smear became increasingly prevalent against any individual or progressive group. 
The press, of course, colluded with this denunciation of people. Being communist or progressive meant that you were identified with the forces that were un-Australian and who threatened the Australian way of life. As Eva Bacon, a life member of the Communist Party and the UAW, and a refugee from Nazi Europe said, only those who lived through the 50s can appreciate the atmosphere of fear, suspicion, and witch hunting, which pervaded all seeds of life, when as governments and right-wing organisations strove to isolate and destroy all opposition, concentrating especially on the Communist Party, the trade unions, the ALP and the peace movement. Thank you. Those guys had. 
Another of the people that uh, had a big influence on me was Alex McDonald. Alec was a mentor for me, really, and I don't think I would have uh, uh, been employed in the trade union movement if it hadn't been for Alec's influence within the trade union and on me myself. For some reason or other, he saw something in me that, uh, that uh, should be encouraged, and uh, I thank him for that. That was a tragic loss in 1969 when he died so prematurely. The Eurythmic people used to go to Toronto as well, and uh, they, they had a holiday camp there, and quite a number of the young people on the children that Connie talked about, they used to be Toronto. As the Toronto became more wealthy, those people moved to Stradbroke Island, and they moved to places like Coochie Butler. One of the people down there that had a big influence on me as well was Mr. Prowse. And Mr. Prowse ran the uh, post office and I worked for at one stage in the post office uh, weighing up potatoes and sort of taking telegrams around and so forth. But Mrs. Prowse was absolutely dedicated to the communist movement and what a wonderful woman she was. I don't think anybody in Toronto would even know who she was now. In the 1950s, I went to Mackay for the Queensland Railway, like this. When I joined the railway, I joined as a trainee. And the job required me to join the union, which I was always a member of the union anyhow. But the chief union I joined was the station officers union. I quickly woke up to the fact that they were just a little right wing group and I left that union and joined the, the ARU and became a delegate for the union in, uh, in Mackay district. And I think while I was there, we had one of the first stoppages in the train fields in the railways uh, after the great 1948 strike. And still a lot of the, the energy for the 1948 strike, believe you me, was running through the railway at the time. If you, if you got a fireman that had been involved in the strike and he was rushed on with a, a driver who then didn't involve himself in the strike, that they, they, they would go off sick rather than work with him. This, this was nearly 10 years later. This was the sort of feeling that was in that 1948 railway strike. In the 1950s, of course, we had the Korean War, and that was a big catalyst for uh, the anti union movement in Australia, and it was very much used against these uh, very decent socialist, communist people because they were depicted as people who were supporting foreign powers against their own people in Australia. That was never the case. That was never the case. I did not know one of those old socialists or communist people, as we, whichever you like to call them, who actually advocated a foreign power taking over Australia. They were people who had an ideal, and the ideal was to have a better society for ordinary people particularly working class people. In my view, the capital system depends entirely on having a cheap labour force. In the early days they had used slave labour, goods and services were provided by slave labour, and the system then moved on with say, slave labour went out to create a great force of low wage workers in every every country. You see it around the world now. You see it in China with the wedges. You see it in America with the so-called uh, white redneck people that they call. 60 million people who were displaced from their farms and their rural lives back in the uh, Second World War days or just before the Second World War when America uh, as a nation built up the great industrial power it built to fight the war. When the war was over, the America was faced, or well, the, the capitalist uh, regime in America was faced with going back to the problems that they had prior to the great leap forward during the war. They couldn't make bombs to drop on countries quite easily, as, as the capitalists were wont to do during the big war. So these people who uh, they were stuck with that sort of uh, society were then the ones that have become the cheap labour force. We've seen a similar thing in Australia. We've had the 
emptying out of the countryside to Australia in recent years uh, for people to move to the cities to become a cheap labour force. If, if it wasn't for trade unions, if it wasn't for the dedication of the people who really believe in things like socialism or communism, which we like to call it, we would find that the working class and these people in this country would have no rights. And that's always been my belief. The Communist Party dissolution bill. I was only 19 when that happened, so I, I can't actually uh, talk with a great experience about it, except this one point. That it was not just directed at the Communist Party, it was directed at this great uh, leap forward that capitalism needs to do by having a subservient, cheap labour force to produce the goods and services that they sell. And the attempts by the, the uh, uh, government of the day, the Menzies regime, was about controlling the minds, controlling the destinies of ordinary people who provide the wealth for those people who, who, uh, who really control the country. Unfortunately, uh, our society in these days, particularly in modern times, We've become very individualistic, our society is very individualistic now, and it makes it very difficult for organisations who really want to uh, work on a collective basis to work. Uh, even, even now, uh, our society has become that way, but it's, it's so individualistic that you have whatever uh, possessions you have, whatever you can get, they can produce a new one, and the old one becomes redundant. And people have got themselves so caught up in that. I would like to see a resurgence of the thinking that drove those old wobblies and those old uh, socialists that I think uh, helped produce a much better country. Thanks very much.
with my parents in Rockhampton. My parents were never members of the Communist Party. However, my father was a strong unionist and he had strong socialist views and he had many communist friends. He worked for the, he worked for the federal government. He was a building industry supervisor and his job took him away from home for up to six weeks at a time. During one of these periods, when he was away from home, the ASIO came to his office, searched his office, interviewed all his work colleagues, sought from them information about him as to whether he may be a danger to the, to the, to the Commonwealth Government with the job that he had, was he a spy, and all this went on. It was a very trying time for our family. He was dobbed in by one of his unkindly work colleagues who informed ASIO. The reason he informed ASIO was that Dad used to take a couple of uh, magazines, the Soviet Union or China Today, along to, the, to his workplace and put them in the, uh, in the work area where they had lunch and things like that. And that was the reason that uh, this man dobbed him into the, to the ASIO. However, he didn't lose his job. He'd been working for the federal government for about the last five years, all the time during the war, building military camps, etc. And the head of the department defended him, and he remained in his job. A sequel to that, that was, though, that there was an English migrant who came to Dad during this period, and he sought work. And uh, Dad told him, well, they didn't have any permanent work, but you know, he felt sorry for the bloke. He said, I'll give you a job as a casual worker for about two or three weeks until you can find another job. So that was all right. The bloke found another job. He found the job on my job, where I was working. And he was only there a couple of days. We were all sitting around on a, on a pile of bricks or whatever, wherever we sat to have our lunches. And this bloke starts to mouth off about my father. This bloke is working with the Commonwealth Government. There's a great danger to, the, uh, uh, to, to our society, you know. Why is he working there? It takes some dreadful things. And here I'm sitting there listening to all this. He didn't know that I was the son of Hugh Hamilton, who he was talking about. And uh, the workers never, uh, the workers who were sitting around didn't inform him either. But I was very upset about this, so I went home and told my father that night, and he was terribly upset. Anyhow, I didn't know about this. I did at the time when it happened. My father came up with a job at the lunchtime the next day, and he called this bloke out. And this bloke said, oh, here we go. how are you doing? What are you doing here? Anyhow, Dad talked to him about uh, you know, what he said in front of my, what he said in front of his son, etc., etc. And, uh, Anyway, the outcome of that was that uh, Dad gave him a bloody belt for one of job. That was very embarrassing, not politically correct. <laughs> I'd like to tell you another story about... Oh. <laughs> I was at that meeting that you referred to in the camp. I was an 18-year-old boy. And prior to going to that meeting, about three months before, I, was a, I, I loved dancing. I used to go dancing every Saturday night with my father and my mother and my sister. And we went there one Christmas Eve to this dance and I was playing a whistle. The sergeant of police who was there, he took the whistle off me. He said, how dare you be blowing the whistles at this time? It was midnight, celebrating New Year's Eve. He took it off. Now let's put that aside, the dancing and the, and the blowing of the whistle. A few months later, this would be in March 1949, I was 18 years of age. <coughs> the Communist Party branch were holding a, a meeting, a nighttime meeting, at the corner of in, in William Street, near East Street and Penn Street. So they were holding a public meeting. The local papers, the Rockhampton Morning Bulletin, it advertised the meeting, it encouraged the people to go along. So did the Catholic Church. We had Archbishop Tynan there, and Catholic action was very strong in, in, in Rockhampton. In fact, Lance Sharkey, the General Secretary of the, 
of the Communist Party of Australia who wrote a book on Catholic action, and he said that Hampton was the centre of Catholic action. So anyway, they organised the flock, all the anti-communists uh, came along, all the bloody hillbillies and whatever, and there were plenty of them in Rock Hampton, they come along too. And I would suggest that the meeting was around two and a half thousand, three thousand people. And I did. So there was 3,000 in the meet. <laughs> At 7 pm, the truck comes along. <coughs> they backed into the meeting place, and there were six people associated with the truck. There were two women and four men. One of the women was Pat Pastor. And uh, I know her father was there, Ted Robinson was there as well. The sound system was set up and the speaker confronted the hostile crowd and he spoke for a half an hour. On the hotel veranda, which was right opposite the speakers who were giving, who were giving the Communist Party talk, there was about 200 people on the veranda of this old time built hotel. They were armed with fruit and eggs and all sorts of other obstacles. All the fruit and the, air, the eggs and all the other rotten vegetable stuff was proudly supplied by the town suppliers, the town shops, etc. <coughs> As the meeting was going on, there was one hillbilly from the, from the meeting itself. He walked across from the meeting to the where the, the speakers were giving the, the talk, to their truck, and he had this smoking instrument in his hand. And it caused a bit of concern amongst the, the people of the meeting because they didn't know what this bloody thing was. Anyway, he goes over there and he puts it underneath the truck. And eventually we all found out what it was. It was a sink bomb. Now remember the policeman who took the whistle off at the dance on New Year's Eve. Well, that policeman was at the meeting too. And I was right in the front of, that, of the meeting. The policeman was at the meeting. And this is what happened. There was a young boy about my age. He, he was standing between me and the policeman, and he had a gun. He had a rifle. He came there to shoot some bastard. And what happened? <coughs> the policeman never confiscated the gun or the, or the gun boy. The whole time he was able to have the, have the gun. After the half hour speech, and being bombarded by all sorts of missiles, and missiles and dripping with bloody fruit and rotten eggs, and a number of injur injuries which were sustained by a number of the comrades, they, de they decided to call it a night. The sound system was dismantled and they packed up. The driver and the women got in the cabin. The others got on the back of the truck and lo and behold, my heart sunk. The bloody truck wouldn't sound. <laughs> so they got killed more and more. And great cheers and glee went up from the, uh, from the audience, uh, this mob that were there, which were organised by the Catholic Church and some of the reactionary uh, forces within Rockhampton and the Rock Rockhampton Morning Bulletin. And keep in mind, this happened in a town which was a big working class town. It had the big railway workshops, it had the meat, biggest meat works in Australia, all of this. The great working class, the great and glory of the working class were on it, on that bloody side, got them from communists with, with fruit and vegetables and all sorts of other things. Well, alas, they got away. And uh, I know my father visited them after that meeting, and uh, we got more details of it from the mouths of the communists who were at that meeting. Neil said that the barriers were broke and they went to, to, to case the communists. They did. I was right in front of the committee. Had they broken the barrier and chased the communists, and this was what some of them what really wanted to do, they would have driven them into the river because the river was right behind where they were. I've talked enough, I know a lot of tales about being ruled with the communists the Communist Party and the working class movement of this state. Maybe I'll get an opportunity to tell you more stories at another time. Thank you very much.
last one at the end. Um, people will be able to share their stories again. So are there any questions? <coughs> Great. Everyone last one. Um, some tea bickies. Oh, one at the end. For that. Thank you very much and congratulations for this activity. Uh, my name is Ovidio Orellana, member of the Communist Party of Australia since 1987. And first of all, congratulations to the panel of speakers, Camara Connie, uh, to mention Camara Jim Henderson, to whom we have been working always together with him. And it's nice to, to have mentioned that so historic camaraderie. And um, one question, as we know now what is the world turning around and around and what is happening now in the United States, one question probably is going to be very short answer. What do you reckon is going to be as the situation is going to be world? Uh, what is going to be in Australia within 20 years later, as the two system parties, sorry for the Labour Party, whatever, but uh, I don't believe in, not in, in them, but they are conducting Australia totally backwards and trying to be a United States situation. The question is, what do you reckon is the way we are going to be in Australia in 20 years later? Thank you. I've got a question for Les Crofton. In your talk, Les, you said that without the Communist Party, we would be engulfed in a global war, if I understood you correctly. My question is, isn't that what we've got? Yes, we certainly have. I mean, do you think this is bad? Just let your imagination run on. Apart from the work in the union movement, the greatest legacy of the activities of the communists and the progress of that, of that period was we were able to stave off an, a, a global 
probably a total bull. Now, those people who say, and I know this has been long winded, but I've got to make this point. Those people who say we've always had war are right. Or maybe. The issue is our capacity to inflict more damage more quickly in a more widespread manner than ever before. And I was just absolutely appalled to see on that replacement, that new opiate of the people on television the other night, that drone. Remote control. No occupants, but remote control from somewhere or other. Only on that individual in the vehicle and just blasting the spectrums. That's frightening stuff. So the role of the Communist Party and progressives in staving off war is not to be underestimated. That's all I'm